So I want to talk for a little while today. For those of you who are new to us, the next 40 or 45 minutes, I want to talk, I want to teach about how faith in God can fill our lives with laughter. We have been teaching, as most of you know, through the Psalms of Ascent, Psalm 120 through 135. And let me just remind you that the Psalms of Ascent were Psalms that were sung or recited by pilgrims who were ascending to Jerusalem to meet God in the major Jewish feast. We're studying this psalm so that we can learn from them how to ascend to God, or as the subtitle of this series says, how to elevate our lives with God. My hope is that these learnings from these psalms will help each of us who truly engage them to grow closer to God and experience significant growth. Even during the middle of the summer, it's possible to experience significant spiritual growth. And we're having a great summer so far, by the way. The psalm that we're studying this week, uh, not just through today's sermon, but also through um, our daily devotionals, which you can receive if you'll uh, ask for it on the connection card uh, that are written by our pastoral team, through our life group discussions, through the daily recommended readings, and so on. The psalm that we're studying this week is the 126th psalm. And uh, it starts like this. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. And you just have to love this. The psalmist says, when God restored our fortunes, it was like a too-good-to-be-true dream had in fact come true, and our mouths were filled with laughter. This brief psalm is a happy psalm. It goes on in the six verses of the psalm to use the word joy four times. It's like, uh, you know, I read this and think, who wouldn't want to serve a God who brings his people laughter and joy? Um, you, are, I'm sure, have seen some of the work that's been done in recent decades around the positive benefits of laughter. This psalm has these folks laughing at their restored fortunes. And um, the fact is that laughter is, is really good for the soul and uh, all of our person. I, I'll just give you a sampling of the kinds of things that are easy to find out there about laughter. For instance, an article from the Psych Psychiatric Times, the, the article's titled, Laughter is the Best Medicine. It's written by Dr. Kavita Kajura. And here's part of what he says. This is a lengthy article. I'll just grab a few things out of it. Laughter is a physical expression of humor and joy that has numerous protective qualities. It's one of the best ways to manage stress and to develop resilience and improve psychological sturdiness. Happiness and humor can improve brain function. Humor releases brain-derived neurotrophic factor which supports existing neurons and encourages the growth of new neurons and synapses. Laughing elevates the pain threshold and can help break the cycle between pain, sleep loss, depression, and immunosuppression. Laughter lowers blood pressure and increases glucose tolerance. Laughter also assists in the recovery and prevention of cancer by increasing natural killer cell activity. Laughter improves the defense against respiratory infections. Humor and laughter produce a discharge of endorphins with both euphoric and calming effects. Humorous interventions may be especially helpful with aging, which really piques my interest. Moreover, increased use of humor in the period following the death of a spouse was found to promote greater emotional resilience, resulting in fewer depressive symptoms. Humor may be the highest of the defense processes of the psyche, which we can invoke to guard against anxiety. I imagine many of you will be familiar with the experience and work of Norm Cousins back in the 1960s and stretching forward uh, through that era. Norm Cousins was Norm Cousins was the editor of at that time the very prestigious Saturday Evening Review, and uh, he was diagnosed with a disease 
of the connective tissue, which in essence meant that the tissue holding his bones together was disintegrating. And the doctors told him that best case scenario is that one out of 500 patients survive this particular disease and that that was optimistic and that they didn't have a whole lot of hope for the medications they would prescribe him to be effective. Well, he decided with the full approval of his doctor to uh, stop taking medication altogether. He just took large doses of, of vitamin C and then began to practice laugh therapy and uh, became quite famous for treating this disease with laughter. And so when he would feel extreme pain, instead of calling for morphine, he'd watch a funny movie. Uh, he would ask someone to read something humorous to him from some book that he knew he would find funny. And he wrote later that it worked. I made the joyous discovery that 10 minutes of genuine belly laughter had an anesthetic effect that would give me at least two hours of pain-free sleep. Well, cousins recovered from this disease. And so astounding was some of what he had learned by practicing laugh therapy that he was the first non-physician to ever have an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine. He was invited to join the faculty of UCLA Medical School where he began to give lectures on how attitudes and emotions can bring on disease and can improve prospects for recovery depending whether the emotion uh, or attitude is positive or negative. It's a stunning thing to consider that this guy laughed his way out of this particular sickness and the medical field became and continues to be fascinated with this. Well, thousands of years before any of this research, Thousands of years before Norm Cousins and his amazing story, the wisest man who ever lived said, a cheerful heart is good medicine, or a cheerful disposition is good for your health. So today, we're going to talk about how through God's presence in our lives and through our faith in him and his promises to us, that we can laugh. We can laugh when we look at events in our past. We can laugh when we look at our present circumstance. And we can laugh when we think about the futures that are ahead of us. And again, we're going to base this in the 126th Psalm. Let me read it to you in its entirety. First in the New International Version and then in the message. Okay, here it is. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Now from the message, it seemed like a dream, too good to be true. When God returned Zion's exiles, we laughed, we sang, we couldn't believe our good fortune. We were the talk of the nations. God was wonderful to them. God was wonderful to us. We are one happy people. And now, God, do it again. Bring rains to our drought-stricken lives. So those who planted their crops in despair will shout yes at the harvest. So those who went off with heavy hearts will come home laughing with armloads of blessing. So let's get at the truth of this psalm by offering three things to laugh at. Three things to laugh at. Here's the first. Located in the first three verses of this psalm, laugh about your past. Laugh about your past. Psalm 126, 1 through 3 again, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, and Zion here is referring to the city of Jerusalem. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Jerusalem, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Now, this is a post-exilic psalm, meaning that it was written after the Jews had returned to Jerusalem after their exile to Babylon. 
And the focus in these first three verses are on the good news that their good fortune has been restored. They're back where they're supposed to be. They're back in Jerusalem, restored to the plans that God had for them. But a subtext here that's very important is that in order for their fortunes to be restored, they had to have first lost their fortunes. The reason they needed to be restored to Zion is that they had been exiled from Zion. The only reason they have a happy song to sing is because they have overcome extremely tragic circumstances. I like the fact, though, that they chose to focus on their restored fortunes, not on their misfortunes. And if we are going to laugh when we look at our past, we, each of us, has to decide what to focus on. The unfortunate setbacks and losses or the way somehow, in spite of any of that, God always shows up if we let him and he always gets us back on the path to our God dream lives. These folks, post-exile, had a tragic story to tell. They had learned over the past years some very hard lessons. They had faced existential challenges. It appeared that they were on the verge, actually, of national extinction, where if God didn't miraculously show up, there would be no more uh, uh, Jewish nation, no more Judah, no more Israel at all. They were on the verge of national extinction. And uh, as bad as all of that was, God restored their fortunes, and looking back on it, they said, it was like a dream too good to be true. And our mouths are filled with laps, laughter, and we are happy people. Now, I'm going to take a few minutes, as is my want, and I'm going to offer now the history lesson portion of today's message. Okay? So, uh, if you find this painful, my encouragement to you today is just to laugh. And uh, we'll be through that part here in a few moments. But in order to get this text, it's important to get the history behind it, which most of you will probably know anyway, uh, whether in detail or not, you'll have some sense of this. And in fact, what I'm about to talk, what I'm about to tell you about the history of this concerning the exile and the return is something you really need to know in order to read lots of parts of scripture and understand what's going on. This is a big, big, big part of what's going on, uh, throughout, uh, scripture from, uh, uh, about the, the well, actually predating this from about the 600 BCs on, this is really important. So, all right, 587 BC, the armies of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded and conquered Jerusalem and all of Judah. This was a terrible culmination of a terrible period for God's covenant people. They had been warned repeatedly. And, and uh, many of the prophecies that you'll find in the Old Testament are warnings to these people that if they don't keep their part of the covenant with God, God and his mercy and his love for them is going to allow them to experience exile so that they can appreciate him and what he brings and their covenant with him when he miraculously brings them back. Well, they essentially ignored God and they got themselves in a situation where God and his love for them got their attention. Uh, and uh, the way that happened is the armies of Babylon ravaged Jerusalem. They burned the houses of the inhabitants of Jerusalem to the ground. They desecrated and destroyed Solomon's temple, which was one of the great wonders of the world. They utterly destroyed it. They stole all the treasures out of the houses of the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. They stole over 5,000 precious treasures, an incalculable fortune of treasure from the temple of Solomon, and they took it to Babylon. And then Nebuchadnezzar gathered together a large majority of the Jews who were still there and still alive, and particularly those who had the greatest gifts and talents, and he marched them from Jerusalem to Babylon, some 800 miles, a virtual death march, 
people dying on the way, unable to uh, 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 make it. You, you can't imagine how horrific the experience was for these people who've lost everything and who have become disconnected from what they believe were God's promises for their life. They had no hope. They had no future. It looked like God had no plans for them. And now they're being marched from Jerusalem to Babylon to start captivity. It's this becomes the context for one of the more famous of the Psalms. It's not a happy Psalm. It's a really sad Psalm. Psalm 137 is about the, the trip to Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. Weeping willows, here you are. We hung our harps on the willows, in the midst of it, Babylon. For there, those who carried us away captive ask of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth. In other words, they said, sing for us, laugh for us. And they had nothing, of course, to laugh about. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. You have to feel the tragedy of this experience where an entire nation is now virtually extinct. Never before in human history had a nation thus conquered and thus exiled, ever been returned to the land that they had been exiled from. Never before in human history. And so, if they're going to be returned to God's plans for their lives, something that's never happened before is going to have to happen. It's virtually impossible. But God sends prophets and a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament are around this. Like, for instance, Ezekiel, to prophesy to these exiled people, far from home, far from God's dreams for them. And Ezekiel, for instance, prophesies that the dead bones of that nation that looks as if they are buried, that God's going to breathe his spirit in those dead bones and cause those bones to come back to life. It's going to be like a nation of zombies returning back to Jerusalem. This is, Ezekiel didn't use the word zombie, at least not in the original Hebrew. But nonetheless, that's, that's, so Ezekiel comes along and says, I know it's never been done before, but God's going to cause what appears to be dead to come to life again. And you find Isaiah saying amazing things like Isaiah 60, 51 is a prophecy to the exiles. The Lord will surely comfort Zion. Remember, it's utterly ruined. The Lord will surely comfort Zion, God says to these, this ruin, and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. I mean, this is the furthest thing from people's minds. They're in Babylon saying, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? But the prophet says, you're going to sing again. You're going to have joy again. You're going to laugh again. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the sound of singing. Those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. Jeremiah was, you know, one of the, he was the, the, the prophet that, that most predicted this, this, this destruction and subsequent exile. But he's also the same guy that God used to say, look, but God still has a plan for you to bring you back. A lot of people have part of his prophecy magnetized to their refrigerator because this is one of the nicest sayings in all of scripture, but it's a saying in its proper context that was given to these exiles. This is what the Lord says, Jeremiah 29, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place, Jerusalem. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Utter impossibility, but God says, I'm going to restore your fortunes. 
And 50 years after the exile began, God speaks to the most powerful man in the world. Babylon is overthrown by Persia. The king of Persia is Cyrus. Persia is a kingdom that just dwarfed what, what Babylon had ever been it, at, at its height occupied some three million square miles of territory on three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. But God speaks to Cyrus about, in the big picture of his world, this small group of people from the backwaters of Palestine, a city that was destroyed called Jerusalem, and God tells Cyrus to send his people back home. We find the text in Ezra chapter 1, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. The Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And this is the first of a series of miracles that make the impossible happen. God brings his people home. The 70 years of captivity are counted to be over until the temple was finished being built, which it was in 516, 515 BC. But the prophecy God had given to Jeremiah, 70 years, and you're going to be back here, came true. And then, you know, the story continues. The story continues, and I say this now just for pastoral education as you're reading some of these texts in the future, so you'll remember the story continues with Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra tells the story of how a leader like Zerubbabel led the exiles back and, and, uh, and, and rebuilt the temple. Um, Ezra himself is a priest and scholar who leads a great revival in Jerusalem and re- renews the people's broken covenant with God. And then Nehemiah, who's a, who's a, who's an official, a Jewish official in the court of Babylon still feels a call from God to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall surrounding the city, and little by little by little, their fortunes are restored. So when you look at Psalm 126, back now to where we started, and you hear the sound of the psalmist saying, God has restored our fortunes, and our mouths are filled with laughter. That's the background that causes the psalmist to be able to say those words. God did the impossible. Our fortunes are restored. They picked their harps back off those willows and returned to Jerusalem with songs of joy. So, first of all, we have to be able to look at our past, and regardless what's happened, we need to find the things we can laugh about. Because there was a sad story to tell, but that's not the story the psalmist is telling. The story says, yeah, we lost our fortune, but God restored it, and our mouths are filled with laughter. Here's the second thing, then, to laugh about. It's to laugh about the future. Let's pick up the psalm. Psalm 126 now, in verse 4, restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. So, the Jews now have returned to Zion, but you have to remember this, guys. Zion was devastated. The city they had known before is gone. The temple they had worshipped at, gone. Their homes, destroyed. Even the land around Jerusalem had been, had been destroyed, M- much of it burned by the conquering Babylonian army. So their fortunes are restored, but then they turn around and say, restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. So it's like, wait a second, when you're reading the psalm, if you're, if, you're, if you're paying attention, and I know I've spent a lot more time wrestling with this this week than, than, um, than uh, I- I- any of you would have. So it's very much in my mind. The psalm starts, our fortunes are restored. And then three verses later, he says, 
restore our fortunes. Which is it? Have your fortunes been restored or do you need your fortunes restored? And the answer, of course, is yes. Our fortunes have been restored and we need our fortunes restored. There's this great prophecy again in Isaiah, Isaiah 61, to those who return to Jerusalem after the exile, which says they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Their fortunes have been restored, but they've been restored to a place that is devastated. This is a dose of reality. They've been delivered from exile, but placed in a city that had to be reconstructed. Listen to the language. Ancient ruins, places long devastated, messed up for generations. They'd been set free, but they'd been set free to a big wreck. There's a lot to be said about all of that. I'll say two things. The first is that um, this is... uh, Good for us to keep in perspective. Let's say even as it concerns when we come to faith in Jesus and we, we become, we're born again. We, we're, we become new creations. And the spirit now of God actually lives in us. And this is very real. And, and, and when we experience this, and most all of you in this room know exactly what I mean. It's like our fortunes have been restored. <laughs> We've been reconnected to God. We are in relationship with him. Whatever language you want to use, I've been redeemed. I've been saved. I've been born again. Hallelujah. Praise God. Our fortunes have been restored. My mouth is filled with joy. However, many of us, though, are restored to a place that's broken. In other words, that doesn't mean all of a sudden God waves the magic Shazam wand over your life and all of a sudden everything's fixed. If you, you know, if your business was broken before you were born again, your business is still broken the day after you're born again. If your marriage is deeply dysfunctional the day you're born again, your marriage is still dysfunctional the day after you're born again. Now, you, I've got good news for you. The God who restored your fortunes now will continue continue to restore your fortunes, but we can't act as if there's not devastation and ruins and there's not stuff in our life where we need God to continue to do the kind of things that he's done to get us to the place that we're in. So he restored our fortunes and we still need God to work in our lives to restore our fortunes. It's why the message has that psalm saying, do it again, Lord, just like you did that thing. Now, here's this other thing in my life that I need you to do it again. Lord, just like you did that thing over there. Here, I need now my fortunes restored in this thing. Do it again, Lord. And the good news is we can still laugh because we know he will. Another way I like to think about this is I like to think about a lot of times, you know, in, the, in this psalm, uh, their fortunes being restored, the psalmist said, is like a dream that's come true. It's like a dream that's come true. And then he says, now help us, God. The dream came true. We're laughing. Now help us. And I've learned that that's something that happens. I, this is kind of, this, this line of thinking that I'm about to offer is something that really helps me in my life. It's the realization that sometimes the dream coming true and God miraculously working to cause the dream comes true just means that you need God to continue working (laughs) so that the dream can continue to come true. Uh, uh, It's like uh, St. Teresa of Avila, the mystic Christian mystic said, uh, she said that she believes there are more tears answered, uh, more tears cried over answered prayers than there are tears cried with people asking God to answer their prayers. Sometimes when we get what we want, it puts us in a, 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 a position where we now have a whole set of new needs. Here's, here's what, I, what came to mind this week. For those of you who've heard me tell this story a number of times, who've read some of my books that has this story in it, forgive me for saying it again, but I know there are a lot of people who haven't heard this story. And I need to remind myself sometimes of things like this. It, it helps me. Um, uh, some, something, so when, when Sharon and I came here to West Orange uh, over 31 years ago, we were invited by a group of 54 people 
uh, to become their pastor. And I'd felt a call to pastor a church in a suburb of New York City since I was a teenager. And even though that didn't seem like a smart career move to me to say yes to that group of people, some of whom are still here and in this room, and several of them were here in the first service today, we knew we were called, and so we came, and uh, uh, I didn't do all the due diligence I probably should have in making a good decision when I was 29. I just felt called, and like I, I didn't look at the financial books before I came. As in, I didn't know I was going to get paid. I didn't know if I was going to get paid. I just, bottom line is, God, we felt God had called us, and we showed up. And so the church had very little of anything except this, this wonderful handful of people. We, we didn't have a building. We were meeting in the basement of Holy Trinity Episcopal Church on Main Street. Uh, you know what the, the basement of Holy Trinity Church smelled like on Main Street? A basement. God bless all the folks who are there, but you know the, the, our Episcopalian friends, they're not meeting in the basement. They're meeting upstairs in a nice auditorium. But we were in the basement, and no, there was nothing about it that was pleasant. It was rough. Set up middle folding chairs every week, and and nonetheless, we moved from there across the street to the Washington Street Schools Gymnatorium. It wasn't much better. And then we moved to the West Orange Community House on Main Street in West Orange. And uh, we were there for about four years. And somehow or another, God in His grace causes His church to start growing. It starts growing, thriving. I'm looking at people in the room right now. You remember those days. We knew that we needed a building, but we didn't have any money. And we start, you know asking people to, to give towards pur purchasing a building. So much detail. I need to be quick and say we ended up buying an old bowling alley, 106 Harrison Avenue, um, 11,000 square feet uh, uh, from the exterior. It looks like a storefront. Well, it is a storefront. Just when you walk through, there's a lot more space than you would think. Contiguous with the liquor lobby on the one side and Polly's Pub on the other. We had all kinds of interesting walk-in business in those days. <laughs> And we moved in this building, about a 240-seat auditorium. If we packed chairs in there, and we started filling that building up several times a week, and we knew, you know, we were going to have to expand considerably. And some, at some point during that time, we had the opportunity to buy a, a, a part of the property owned by the Augustinian Recollects, uh, the Order of Saint Augustine's. Uh, the, the head, the international headquarters of St. Augustine's order actually at that time was in West Orange. Sharon and I lived across the street from it, and we were always afraid to walk on the property. You just see the monks over there walking around, and was, I, I'm a pastor, and I was a little frightened by the whole thing, but one day, oh, this is too much detail, <laughs> but the detail's kind of fun. One day, two, I, there's a knock at the door, and there are two monks standing there in their monk stuff. And uh, they look at me and say, I don't know how they even knew who I was, but I know how they... The town had told them that our church needed property, and the town wanted us to stay in town because we'd become such an intricate part of the community, and we're serving the community in so many ways. And they knew the monks were going to sell the property, and they asked the monks to come and offer it to me. And so they're knocking on my door. And they honestly, I wouldn't know, hi, I'm Brother Anthony, I'm Brother Michael. Uh, we want to sell you our property. Would you like to buy it? And anyway, we had to go through quite a process for that to happen, but we bought six and a quarter gorgeous acres in a, in a, in a, a neighborhood here in West Orange called the St. Cloud Neighborhood with the attention, we called it the Ridgeway Campus on Ridgeway Avenue, with it, and it was a 9,000 square foot historic home on it, just gorgeous and, and uh, so on. But we were going to build this there, and we started working towards that, and it became apparent that it was going to be a challenge to get approvals to do that because this property, old growth trees, and, and back in a quiet neighborhood, and so on and so forth, a, a lawyer who lived on the border of the property who was a neighbor of mine who our daughter babysat for, who said to me very clearly, if you build on this building, we will sue you. So, you know, we, we a really nice neighbor. And... Um, so anyway, you know, so, but we're still moving forward. You know, God does the impossible. And then one day, one day I'm reading the Western's Chronicle and I read an article about a 
piece of property in West Orange that I didn't know existed down Northfield Avenue, a 24-acre piece of property, and a well-known Jewish developer named Larry Pantera was buying this property, and he's going to develop a luxury condominiums on it, and, and, and he wanted to donate the front eight acres to the township of West Orange, that which was frontage on Northfield Avenue, because uh, he knew that if he made a donation to open space that maybe they'd let him uh, develop more densely otherwise than, than the town plan allowed. And when I read that article, guys, I don't know how to tell you this. I don't know how to tell you this. When I read that, I knew that front eight acres was ours. And <laughs> yeah, well. And so a couple of days later, I'm standing on the watching uh, I think Christian played baseball at Little League Field in Livingston, and I'm standing beside the town attorney, Richard Frink, who is a good friend of mine, and his son was on, the, on our team. And uh, I said, Richard, I have this idea. Here's my idea. I want you guys to take the front eight acres from Larry Pantera that he's offered to you, and I want to swap properties with you. We'll give you the Ridgeway campus, and you can put a pocket park back there. You give us the eight acres on Northfield. And he looked at me like, you're insane. And, uh, and, but there started a process where I think basically a group of people together got together and said, he's crazy. Of course, I talked to our board and elders. They already knew I was crazy, and they kind of got into where they were willing to give craziness a chance, and, and so they're kind of open to it. I'm, I imagine thinking this would ever actually be a, be a possibility. Months and months and months pass. Nothing's going on. The only conversations about it are your crazy conversations. I remember one day during during that time, uh, you know, again, this was an abandoned, this was an abandoned farm and hadn't been worked for many, many years. Abandoned farmhouse, abandoned gas station on the front. It, 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 so there was no road, there was no stoplight, there was none of that. It was overgrown with weeds up about this high. And one day I drove my car up on the mud road. That was the only way you could access the property. And I drove up here and I had a staff team member with me, Andrew McLeese at that time. And I said, Andrew, I want to show you something. I want you to come with me. And I took him up here and walked through the weeds to about this point on the property. And I said, Andrew, I believe that someday there's going to be a worship center right here. I mean, it's a total a craziness, a total mess. I believe one day there's going to be a worship center right now. I believe God's put this in my heart and I want us to stand here right now and I want us to pray that someday that this dream that God's given me will come true. <laughs> to make a very long story short, you know, I've almost forgotten about it. And one day I'm getting ready to play lunchtime back basketball at the Montclair YMCA, which I did. It was, I got to do more stuff like that when the church was smaller. Thanks a lot. But anyway, uh, I'm going to play lunchtime basketball at the Montclair YMCA. And my cell phone rings as Richard Trink on the phone. Hey, Reverend, I've got the mayor on the phone, the mayor, John McKeon, who's now the deputy leader of the, of the state assembly, who's a dear friend of mine. And, and, and John gets on the phone and he says, Terry, you know this idea you started talking about, about swapping properties? He said, you know what? We've come to believe that's exactly what we should do. That's the only way everybody gets what they need here in order to win for our community. And we'd like to set in process a, a negotiation to get that done. That answer to prayer wreaked tremendous havoc in my life for the next 10 years. 10 long years of complicated multi-party negotiations, of zoning, planning, and township council meetings, of not-in-my-backyard neighbors, of unscrupulous opponents who spread terrible lies about me, and our church in an attempt to stop the project altogether of bond programs, capital campaigns, and loans, of blasting and removing $1 million of rock just to prepare the site, of construction setbacks, stoppages, and construction again, of building inspections and certificates of occupancy, and a considerable loss of hair. Ten years. So here's the deal. I got... What I believe God had promised me, but what I believe God had promised me put me in a position where I needed a whole lot more of God to show up to bring what he promised me fully to pass. <laughs> I 
Our fortunes have been restored. Oh, God, what did I get into? You get the point and see that's what happens. That's what happens. You, 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 you start the new business, the ribbon cutting, our fortunes are restored, our mouths are filled with laughter. Oh, this is wonderful. Three years later, you're trying to work out an agreement with the IRS about taxes you had no idea you owed. You just had to fire an employee. You're trying to figure out how to scale the business and meet competition for, from somebody who started a business just like yours down the street. Restore our fortunes, Lord. We got... I got what I wanted, but now I have to deal with the consequences. I need you to do again what you did to get me in this place. It's the couple who walks down the aisle at the wedding, who dances at the reception. Our fortunes have been restored. Our mouths are filled with laughter. It's like a dream came true. But sometime over the next five years or seven years or 10 years or 15 years, for most married couples, it feels like at some moment the dream may be turned into a nightmare. Our Fortunes were restored. Restore our fortunes, O Lord. Because to make a marriage work, you have to do more than laugh at the celebration, right? You have to work hard to make it work over the course of many years. And if we're fortunate in our life, it's a constant cycle of, look what God did. Oh, God, please do it again. Look what God did. Oh, God, please do it again. And this is okay. This is the way life's supposed to be. Psalm 126, our fortunes have been restored. Oh, Lord, look, the temple's got to be rebuilt. Got to rebuild our house. Got to build up a business. Got to go try to recover this land so we can plant something and things will grow again. And I have a feeling some of you are in places like that in your life right now. But let me tell you something. You might as well go ahead and laugh because you know what caused you to laugh when God did it last time is the same thing that's going to cause you to laugh when God does it again. And here's the third thing then, and I've basically already said it. Laugh right now. See, what we have to learn to do, because we know these truths, and we always know God is showing up and restoring our fortunes, that there's, this is what's going on. You know, sometimes, some of you right now, some of us, we've got, you know, it's all fortunes restored in one area of our life, and over here there's another area of our life where we desperately need our fortunes restored. And this is, but when we know this, and we know God's going to show up and do the kind of things only God can do, why don't we just go ahead and laugh now? See, here's, what 120, here's how the psalm closes. 126, 5 and 6, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Sowing here represents the work we have to do to see the next dream come true. Sowing is hard. Sowing is praying. Sowing is acting in faith. Sowing is taking risk. Sowing is facing the inevitable resistance that comes against dreamers and their dreams. Sowing is putting seed in the ground and it disappears and you see nothing happening, but you have faith that God is doing something even though you can't see it. But see what we know, guys, we might as well go ahead and leap forward to this point, is that those who sow in tears will reap in joy. So we might as well go ahead and have joy when we sow rather than just weeping. We might as well go ahead and laugh where we're in that process because we know God's going to come true. We know what another psalm says, that though weeping may last for a night joy always comes in the morning so i suggest that we resolve to laugh even in a season of sowing we know harvest is coming it's important to remember as i wrap this thing up don't wait to be happy until a thing happens Know that if you'll practice what I like to call, and I write about in the hospital leader at length, the discipline of hope, that you can be happy even before the thing that you think is going to make you happy happens because you practice hope 
like the great W.E. Vines defined hope in the New Testament as the happy anticipation of the good. And see, the fact is all the science says, and there's a lot of science around this right now, that when we hope, when we see something we want to happen in our minds as if it happened, that we are happy in that moment. Literally, when we hope, it releases serotonin and endorphins and dopamine. And it's, it's like hoping for something, happily anticipating for something, imagining a thing coming true before it happens. It's like taking a miracle drug, laughing at the future. Before the future occurs, causes you to be happy right now. I've said this before, but it's been good for me to remember this even this week. You know, during those long years between standing, standing in the grass, confessing and praying and sowing in tears for something that existed only in the mind of God, in those years between then and, you know, the first day that we walked into this worship center and had our first service many, many times. I would, well, there's this great passage in scripture, Psalm, Proverbs 31, that talks about the woman who, who was full of dignity and it said that, that, that she laughed at the days to come. See, when you're in the difficult day, when you're in the sowing and tears day, you have to learn to laugh in those moments. It's an expression of faith. It, it creates environments for God to do things. Well, sometimes, there were dark periods in those 10 years. If I told you how many times it seemed, well, we, literally until the very end, we, we, we never were able to completely figure out on paper where the money was coming from to build this. I mean, it was pretty much a daily thing. And um, struggles with the town, struggles with, let's just put it like this. There were some times when it looked like this would never, ever happen. And, uh, you know, this is one story of my life, but it's a kind of, you know, it's, you paint a word picture when we're sitting here right now. But I would lay in bed sometimes, sleepless, it's dark, I'm concerned, and I would force myself to hope. I would force myself to imagine the future that didn't yet exist coming to pass. I would lay in bed and I would imagine getting in my car and driving to Vizcaya Avenue, a road that did not yet exist, and stopping at a stoplight that did not yet exist. And I'd imagine stopping at the light, I was in my mind, I'd always imagine having to stop there. I'd stop there, I'd turn on my turn signal, this is in my head, and I'd hear it clicking. And then I turn up this road and I'd look at a sign to my left that said the Life Christian Church. There was no Life Christian Church there, but it existed in God's mind and it existed in mine. And I drive up the sky and I look at a pond that hadn't been dug yet. And I look at a building to my left. We had architectural renderings. I could imagine what it looked like. And I drive in my mind. I drive real slow and I'd look at it. I'd look at it from over there looking this way. And then I pull into a parking lot. There was no parking lot except in my mind. And I drive around the building and I'd imagine it was Sunday morning. I'd drive all the way around and I'd already picked out as a point of faith where, where I was in a park on Sunday mornings. And uh, uh, my car's parked right there, right now, this morning. I'd imagine, I'd imagine it before there was a spot there. I'd pull up and I'd, I'd pull the car and I'd stop it and, and I'd listen in my mind to turning off the engine. And then I put it in gear and open the door and listen to the door creak in my mind and I get out and walk out and walk around the side of the building to a door that I walked in this morning to walk up to my office before walking in here and then I'd imagine walking in this room and I'd imagine there being a band on the stage singing songs of praise to God and I, I, I'd imagine I'd imagine what, what, what that was like and I'd imagine standing right here in this pulpit and looking out at a crowd like you and preaching and even though I was sowing in tears I was laughing at the days to come because I know that those who sow in tears will reap in joy so we might as well go ahead and laugh now <laughs> 